All right. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, I did number one, yes? Yeah. I did number two, yes? I described the lining? No. Yep. Uh, the function of the larynx, yes? No. no. I didn't? You did one, two, and ten. Yep. One, two, and ten. Yep. Oh, the function of the larynx is to, um, it houses the vocal cords. Well, well, well. Boom. You got me? No. Wait, what? What all do we write? The function of the larynx? Yeah, it houses the vocal cords. Bam. I give you a softball question. Yeah, right. I did. You write that. That's all you want? Yeah, that's it. So the, the function of the larynx houses the vocal cords? Yes. So it produces speech, right? Okay. All right. All right, so I know exactly what I'm gonna, where I'm going to start. I know exactly what I'm going to do. Okay, are you ready? Who's ready? Who's ready? All right, hang on. Okay, write this down. Never forget it. Who's going to write this down and never forget it? Tamaya, are you going to write this down and never forget it? Okay, that's real good. Okay, watch. What's the thick, tough lining that covers the inside of the thoracic cavity called? What? What's the thick, yeah. tough lining? That's right, the parietal pleura. You better, did I, I know I told you this then. What's directly connected to the diaphragm? The parietal pleura, you better know this. The visceral and parietal pleura of both lungs are separate. That means, that means, that what happens to one lung doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen to both lungs. So the visceral and parietal pleura of the right and left lung are separate, but the parietal pleura of both lungs are directly connected to the diaphragm. The diaphragm is a skeletal muscle. So can you control your skeletal muscles? For the crowd, pick my nose, make a fart sound with my armpit. You got me? So you can control them. So what that also means is that inputs from the brain, have to, you have to stimulate, you have to think, and then the spinal cord has to send electrical impulses down to your diaphragm to make it contract. Can you control your breathing? Yeah, watch not going to breathe for a week. Do you follow this? Okay. So here we go. What's directly connected to the diaphragm? The parietal pleura. What part of your brain controls breathing? Medulla what? Right. That's why alligators are mean too. All right. What's the stimulus for breathing? That's nice. That's really good. So here we go. I want this whole thing, whole thing. Ready? Here we go. That's not an ear. That's the medulla oblongata. Oh, by the way, when you take your respiratory quiz, when you hand it in, if you sing the song, Medulla Oblongata, right, I'll give you extra credit. Okay? All right, so here we go. The medulla oblongata is connected to the spinal cord. You're with me. And between cervical vertebrae number three 
and cervical vertebrae number five. There's a nerve that exits the spinal cord. That nerve is called the phrenic nerve. The phrenic nerve is what stimulates the diaphragm to contract. Who's with me? So watch, watch. True or false? You need ATP to make your muscles contract. Good. So when you start contracting your muscles like this, that was good. You're going to break down ATP to make your muscles contract. And what's going to build up inside your muscle cells? ADP. And what stimulates the enzymes of metabolism within your muscle cells to start speeding up and breaking down more glucose or fat, the fuel that's most readily available? See? I just laid it right out for you. And what are the byproducts of metabolism? ADP. Yeah, H2O. Forget about that. But those are the big ones. Tell me you got that. And what do those do to the arteries that supply the muscles that are contracting? And when the little left ventricle contracts, what does arterial blood always take? The path of least resistance, so that's how the heart knows to send that oxygenated blood to the active muscles. Do you follow that? So what's going to happen to the amount of carbon dioxide in the blood? Right, because I put the arrow going up. But actually you said that before I completed the arrow. So as CO2 is going up, that's going to stimulate the medulla. Are you following me? As CO2 increases in the blood, that's going to stimulate the medulla. And the medulla is going to send electrical impulses down the spinal cord. And those electrical impulses are then going to be transmitted through the phrenic nerve, both right and left. Say yes. And where does the phrenic nerve exit the spinal cord? Between C3 and C5. And when the phrenic nerve stimulates the diaphragm, to contract, the diaphragm flattens out. What's directly connected to the diaphragm? The parietal pleura. So watch. When the diaphragm contracts, it's going to pull the lungs down. And when you pull the lungs down, you make them bigger. Who's following this? And you learn in chemistry the gas laws. I'll never forget it. It was a Monday. Boyle's Law. Boyle's Law states that if you increase the volume of your lungs, that leads to a decreased pressure inside the lungs. Who's, who's with me? So watch. Observe. Here we go. Boom. 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 Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Tell me you followed that. So when CO2 builds up, that's going to stimulate the medulla. The medulla is going to generate an electrical impulse that's going to travel down the spinal cord, exit the spinal cord between C3 and C5, stimulate the phrenic nerve to cause the diaphragm to contract. And when the diaphragm contracts, it flattens out and pulls the lungs down with it. And when you elongate the lungs, what happens to the volume of your lungs? And when you're, the volume of the lungs increases, what happens to the pressure inside the lungs? It decreases. When you decrease pressure inside the lungs, the atmospheric pressure becomes greater than the pressure in the lungs. And where does air always go? High pressure to low. So air will enter your lungs. Say yes. How do you get the air out? In young, healthy people, it's the elastic recoil of the lungs. It, the lungs are like the heart. They're kind of like a rubber band. So when you take a breath in, contract the diaphragm. When you blow the breath 
out, it is simply the elastic recoil of the lungs. So the rubber band, you know, stretching back and the air comes out. In old people like me, they have to work to get that air out. That COPD can't get air out of their lungs, so they have to work at it. Say yeah. How many people followed that? For real? True or false? True or false? True or false? You need more oxygen and you produce more carbon dioxide when you're exercising. Good. So do you have to get in more oxygen and remove more carbon dioxide in your lungs? That's true. So you have to breathe deeper and faster when you're exercising. Say yes. Okay, here comes dude. see that how the ribs are angled down we see that okay watch better write this down there are muscles in between your ribs the Latin term for rib is costal how many people knew that these muscles between the ribs are called intercostal muscles. Mm -hmm. What are the two things that muscle can do? Don't you wish that was a question on the midterm? Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll put that on there. Okay, watch. So when the muscles between your ribs contract, because of excuse me, the angle of the ribs, when they contract, they pull the rib cage up. At break, you can do this. Just kind of grab it and just kind of pull it up. Are you following? So what happens to the diameter of your chest when you start contracting your intercostal muscles? Watch. It gets what? What? It gets bigger. And any time you increase the volume of your lungs, what happens to the pressure inside your lungs? it decreases. So the greater the volume, the greater the pressure difference, and the more air will go into your lungs. Tell me you got that. How many people follow that for real? So watch. Most healthy people breathe diaphragmatically. Unless they hear me say, I want this whole thing. Then it's... <laughs> So if you have a little kid, what's here? Guts. You got me? Is there extra space in your abdominal cavity? What can you put in there? Like, do you have extra space there? No, look. Look at Joey over there. Any extra space over there? No. So watch. When the diaphragm contracts, oh, hey. <laughs> when the diaphragm contracts, look, look. When the diaphragm contracts, it pulls down. So what does it do to your guts? It squishes them. Say yes. So if you have a little kid and they're watching Teletubbies and you see their belly ballooning out, have you ever seen that? You've seen it, haven't you? They're in trouble. They're not breathing so good because they are trying to massively contract their diaphragm to increase the volume. Do you follow that? And in kids where it's really bad, you will actually see 
the spaces in between their ribs. It's called intercostal muscle retraction. And they are really trying to breathe hard. Tell me you got that. So this is what you do with the little kid. You take them like this, and you get your fatty acid to the emergency room. They're in trouble. And their belly will like, boom. Like they're pregnant, now they're not. Pregnant, now they're not. You've seen it. If they're doing that, and they're just laying there, they're in trouble. Because healthy people breathe with their diaphragm. If you are laying there and you are using the accessory muscles of breathing, you in trouble. Say yes. Okay. That's how and why we breathe. So, so that means the diaphragm is just not working properly? No, the diaphragm is working fantastic. It, it is contracting like a mofo, right? And you are, I'm not kidding, you, it's contracting, trying to make the lungs bigger to, to create a greater pressure difference to get more air into your lungs. But if your airways are constricted, like an asthma, then you have to try to increase that airway pressure. And how you increase that airway pressure is by creating a greater lung volume. Say yes. You got that? That's how and why we breathe. Bam. I just did that. Tamaya, how would you feel about that? She felt real good about it. I did. You did, okay. Yeah, there's a video. It's called How and Why We Breathe. Is that, so you put that on YouTube? It's on YouTube. Oh, it's not it's on Timmy YouTube. videos. Okay. You gotta type that in. I think I told you that though, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. I just need a second. Yeah, you just wasted 20 seconds of my life there. Sorry. You can <laughs> cut that out of it. All right, watch. Number five. Here, I'll come over there. Can you see? What? Did I tell you what I did one time? I had this guy over there in the window when he was doing this. <laughs> and now he's going to play And then the president of the college, Brian Albrecht, brought some of these Japanese people in <laughs> <laughs> to observe my classroom. <laughs>
And if you can't contract your diaphragm, then you need to be on mechanical ventilation. Tell me you got that. Now watch. If you damage your spinal cord, one, two, three, four, five, tell me you're with me. If you damage your spinal cord below C5 and above T1, thoracic vertebrae number one, so this area here, you are still a quadriplegic, but can the medulla communicate with the phrenic nerve? Yeah. Yes. So based on this information, you can look at somebody's a quadriplegic and determine the level of their spinal cord injury, whether they're on mechanical ventilation or not. If they're on mechanical ventilation, then you know their cervical in, they have a cervical injury above C5. Below it and above T1, they're still a quad, but if they're not having requiring mechanical ventilation, then you know it was below C5 and above thoracic vertebrae number one, say yes. And the old saying is C5, below C5, still alive. That's how you determine if somebody requires mechanical ventilation. All right? And why do some quads have to be on a ventilator and some don't? It's determined the level of the injury in the spinal cord. And just so you know, the only time you sever your spinal cord is if somebody chops off your head. You got me? Watch. Why do people get a bed sore if you don't turn them every two hours? You cut off blood flow. You got me? Watch. Your spinal cord is soft tissue, and it is embedded. It's protected by your bones, your vertebral column. So when you damage your spinal cord, you get inflammation. And that inflammation isn't going to expand out it's going to expand in and crush and cut off blood flow to your spinal cord. That's how a spinal cord injury happens. Say yes. That's why watch. You twist your ankle, how long does it take for that swelling to go down? A couple of days. That's why if you know anyone who's had a spinal cord injury, right after the injury, the doctors will say, we don't know. We don't know. Because what they're going to look at is how much of that inflammation and how much damage to that spinal cord. And maximum inflammation doesn't occur until a couple of days after they had the injury. That's why they give them steroids right away, because steroids reduce inflammation. All makes sense. So does this guy. Look. Just them two boys got my money. How many people followed that? Okay, here we go. <clears throat> you know what, I don't even have to race this. This is right what I needed. Ready? No, nope, I'm good, I, got, I know exactly what I'm doing most days. What's this? Good. What's this? What's this? Capillary. What kind of capillary? Nice. Nice. Better write this down. Better not pout. This is a pulmonary capillary. How thick is a pulmonary capillary? How thick is an alveoli? One cell membrane thick. Tell me you got that. So the only place that gases are exchanged in the body, numero uno, at the alveoli and the pulmonary capillary and the systemic capillary and the cell. Say yes. How many people got that? What kind of air do we breathe? Good air, right. Air that's high in oxygen. So watch, everybody, go ahead, take a big deep breath. <gasps> yeah, feel good? 
What kind of blood is being pumped by the right side of the heart? That's very good. Deoxygenated blood. Blood that is low in oxygen. And where do all things always go? So oxygen will move from an area of high concentration through a selectively permeable membrane to an area of low concentration. Say yes. What is, do we have, a, do we breathe air that's high in carbon dioxide? No. So the air that we breathe is low in carbon dioxide, but the blood that's being pumped by the right side of the heart is what? High in carbon dioxide. So where do things always go? So CO2 will leave, oxygen will come in, and you blow out the CO2, and now this blood is highly oxygenated. Say yes. And where does all the blood from the lungs, how do, where does it go next? To the left atrium through what vessels? The pulmonary veins. Are you following? This is so exciting. Yeah. I think I got a tinkle. Wait. 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 Okay, watch. Your heart is a Yeah, big wow. So watch. All of that venous blood, all of that venous blood that's high in what? High in CO2 and low in O2 gets pumped to the lungs. And the only place that gases are exchanged is in the pulmonary capillary and the alveoli. So you take a big deep breath in, that alveoli is high in oxygen, so oxygen comes into the blood, CO2 leaves the blood and goes into the alveoli and you exha exhale that, say yes. And all that newly oxygenated blood comes back to what side of the heart? What side? Left side. Watch. It's amazing. Are you watching this? Who's looking? Oh, look. And then magically it turns red. Then it comes back to the left atrium, mitral valve, left ventricle. Say yes. And then down to the cells of the body. Tell me you got that. And then that arterial blood, which is high in oxygen. Do you, are you following this? You have to be following this. This is too good not to. It's high in oxygen, and the cell used oxygen. So oxygen goes into the cell. And what's a byproduct of metabolism you got to get rid of? Say yes. Tell me you got that. For real you got that? That is, of course, beautiful. You don't think that's cool? It is. You have no idea how important that is. Okay, here we go. I told you, too, it says oxygen when oxygen goes in there. All right, here we go. Did it look like somebody peed right there? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Watch. That kind of looks like a fat chicken leg, too. Use your imagination. <laughs> or, look up. <coughs> a baby elephant. Look, there's his eye and then the trunk. <laughs> Can you dissolve a gas in a liquid? Can you? Yeah. I'd say no. <laughs> yes or no? No, no. I would say no. O2 is going into the blood, right? Say yeah. I would say yes. I would say yes too. Watch. 
I had to do this in my advanced class, so it might not work. Did you hear that? That's CO2 dissolved in my diet Mountain Dew. That <coughs> rhymes. Do you follow that? Can you dissolve a gas in a liquid? That's very good. What? Well, I don't think there's any left. We'll make another pea stain. It's probably some spit in there. Yee. Yeah. Yee. Yeah. Are there gas bubbles in there? Are there? Can you dissolve carbon dioxide in a liquid? Yes. What's your blood mostly made out of? Water. Okay, well, okay, uh, yeah, I'll give you that. This is general. <laughs> Water, right? Mm -hmm. So you can dissolve a gas in a liquid. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. I'm going to let that dry, too, and make another pea stain. I want this whole thing. Did I tell you about Marianne? She sat right there. I told you about her. Every time I'd say, I want this whole thing, she'd go, <coughs> <laughs> so after the third time, right, I go, I want this whole thing. <clears throat> so I just pulled my chair back. I go, Marianne, are you okay? I'm fine. I'm like, okay. Anyways, here we go. Watch. One of the ways that you transport oxygen is dissolved. There's only one S in dissolve, right? Is there one or two? Yeah, you don't know either. Dis I think there's just one today. <laughs> Dissolved in the plasma of the blood. And it's measured as a partial pressure. You got me? And the partial pressure is abbreviated PO2. What's one of the ways oxygen is transported in the blood? Dissolved in the plasma. How is it measured? A partial pressure. And how is partial pressure of oxygen abbreviated? PO2. PO2. Tell me you got that. Mm -hmm. Why is it important that you know this? Why is it important that you know this? It's a question on the quiz. It's a question on the quiz. Number seven. Number seven. Watch. I'll tell you why it's important. Listen up because this is true. You know this intuitively, right? If you know that there are different types of blood, right? Mm -hmm. And that if you give the person the wrong type of blood, what happens to that person? Die. They will die. They will. They will die. When you as a nurse have to give a patient blood, you have to give up your firstborn, literally. There are so many checks and balances, right? Because if you give the person the wrong blood, they will die. And when you get into advance, I'll explain why they die. That's not pretty. Are you with me? So how many people have this skill that they know the no uniform number of any player from 1973 to 1983 in the starting lineup of the National League? Who has that skill? Yeah, that's right, I do. Nobody else. Watch. One skill I never saw is when someone was working in the emergency room and blood was spurtulating out of somebody, they could go, that's A negative all day. Better call up for three units of A negative blood. Can anybody do that? No, they can't, right? But watch. If they're bleeding their own blood and it takes a while to get the right blood type, do you just sit there and wait till they bleed to death? You stop the bleeding the best you can 
And then you start big old IVs and give them what? You give them saline because you learned today that there's another way you can transport oxygen in the blood and it's what? Dissolved in the plasma. Dissolved in the plasma. And plasma of the blood is 0.9% sodium chloride or normal saline. Do you follow that? Mm -hmm. Now, is that the best way to transport oxygen? No. no, but it's a way. And that's why you stop the bleeding big IVs, you start pouring saline into them, and then you get some blood, you type and cross match their blood, and then get the correct blood. Say, yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you explain to me why O negative blood? You can give O negative blood to anybody. Do you know why? Right, and in this class, I'm going to explain that to you. So you can go around, maybe your neighborhood, while you're trick-or-treating with your kids and missing class, and explain to them why. You can give O negative blood to anybody. I think what you should do is make a video of it, and then we can, I'll put it on YouTube, and we can watch. So I like, like, hey, you know, what's your kids' names? Me? Yeah. I have four. You know, oh, go ahead. Maya, Abby, Lucy, and Eddie Jr. Okay, so we'll have, we'll see Maya, Eddie... Junior, Abby, uh, <laughs> 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 trick or treat, right? You know, I always like the I like the Reese peanut butter cups, right? The Snickers, right? And um, you know what a good too, but they're bad for your teeth. Are Butterfinger? Yeah. You can eat that thing a week later, right? Oh yeah, there it is. Oh. <laughs> okay, all right, so. What's one of the ways that you transport oxygen in the blood? Dissolved in the plasma, and it's measured as a partial pressure, and it's abbreviated as a? Okay, here we go. What? I'm going to answer two, two questions in one. Ready? What's the best way to transport oxygen in your blood? There isn't any way. What's that? How'd you know? Because you always make a big. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's red too. Sometimes I don't make them red. Get this right. That's a red blood cell. Does a red blood cell have a cell membrane? It's a red blood cell. <laughs> <laughs> Ready? What's the protein found in a red blood cell? That's very good. Very good. You better write this down. And embedded in the heme portion of the hemoglobin are these things. What's this? Iron. Iron. How many people here got a hoopty? Anybody? A hoopty. <laughs> a beat up car. Anybody? Does it got rust on it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Watch. There is iron in the metal that makes up a car. And when you chip the paint off it, it is exposed to the oxygen in the air. Mm -hmm. And when oxygen binds to iron, it turns it rusty. That's why your blood is red. Now Spock, he has copper in his hemoglobin. So when oxygen binds to his copper, it turns it green. Say yes. Who's with me? You better write this down because I'm not writing it down. You're a student. Each hemoglobin molecule has four atoms of iron. And each atom of iron is capable of carrying one molecule of oxygen. So I'm going to do a math problem for you. How many oxygen molecules can each hemoglobin molecule carry? 
4. Say yes. Now, 98% of all of your oxygen is transported bound to the iron on hemoglobin. The other 2% is transported, dissolved in the plasma of your blood. So what's the absolute best way to transport oxygen down to the cells of your body? Attached to the iron on a hemoglobin molecule embedded in a red blood cell. So anything that decreases the amount of red blood cells in your blood, a lot of blood and cells, is going to decrease oxygen delivery to the cells of your body. Say yes. So watch. What do women do once a month? <laughs> Who said that? That sounded like a feminine voice. Oh, you said that? Okay. Well, they bleed once a month. Say yeah. And when they bleed, they bleed their own blood. Are you writing that down? <laughs> And when they bleed their own blood, what is bleed, what's leaving them? So that's why a lot of women, young women especially, they have very heavy menstrual periods, suffer from iron deficiency anemia. Yes. So what do they take? Iron. <laughs> How many people got that? Okay, here's the important piece. Each red blood cell contains 250 million molecules of hemoglobin. So how much oxygen can one red blood cell carry? 250 million. And I, I'm not even kidding. One day I stayed up and I counted got to 12 and fell asleep. So one red blood cell can carry a billion molecules of oxygen. So what's the best way to transport oxygen? Bound to the iron on hemoglobin in a red blood cell. Say yes. What's hemoglobin? What'd you say? A protein. What are proteins made out of? <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> what are proteins made out of? My name is? Amino acids. Amino acids chemically bonded together. And we learned, if we learned anything, we learned this. Proteins are temperature and pH sensitive. Didn't we learn that? Yeah, yeah we did. What's the byproducts of metabolism? That's very good. Tell me you got that. Tell, uh, who's following this? I really have to actually pee now. I don't, hang on. All right, it'll, just, just talk, hey, talk about this. <laughs> Which of the following? 
Okay, how, how many people are with me here? You're following us. Guys? Okay. That's a leg. What does the, if you're running, what does the leg produce? I ain't got enough room there. And wait. Ready? Mm -hmm. Watch. What's that? A yellow red blood cell? Yeah, it's a yellow red blood cell. <laughs> What's the protein inside a red blood cell? Mm -hmm. What's embedded in the heme portion of the hemoglobin? Mm -hmm. Iron. And what is bound to the iron in the lungs? Oxygen. Who's with me? What do these things do to the arteries that supply your legs? Right, did you notice how I made that artery bigger? What's hemoglobin again? So watch. As that red blood cell takes the path of least resistance, as it gets closer to the metabolically active parts of your body, what's going to happen to the temperature of the blood? It's going to go up. And what's going to happen to the pH of the blood as that red blood cell starts getting closer and closer? It's going to go down. And when that red blood cell starts moving down, maybe I can move it down. Well, part of the hemoglobin. <laughs> is that red blood cell starts getting closer and closer to the metabolically active parts of the body. Who's with me? What's going to happen to hemoglobin? It's going to change shape. Who's following me? And that oxygen that used to be bound to that iron because the hemoglobin got its shape changed because of the heat and the pH change, the oxygen's going to fall off, and it's going to go sit at the end of the electron transport chain. Mm -hmm. Tell me you got that. Yeah. So watch. It is obvious, clear, that it is metabolism that dictates blood flow. It is also metabolism that dictates how much oxygen is distributed to the cells. Mm -hmm. Tell me you got Now watch. Watch how perfect this is. If you start exercising, running even harder, do you have to contract more muscle? Yes. Do you need more ATP? Yes. So more ADP is going to build up, more CO2 is going to build up, more hydrogen ions are going to build up, and more heat's going to build up. So that's going to dilate the arteries even more. And that's going to produce more oxygenated red blood cells going to that area. And because of the increased heat and the drop of pH, it's going to change the shape of red blood cells even more. And more oxygen is going to fall off the iron and go into the cell. It's perfect. 
Tell me you followed that. That's half of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. I just explained to you how oxygen knows to fall off the iron and go into the cell. How many people followed that? If you've been drinking the Kool-Aid, you understood that perfectly, didn't you? No, you'll study it. Don't worry about it. Tell me you got that. Watch. What does heat, fever, do to the rate of chemical reactions in your body? So if metabolism goes faster, you will produce more CO2, you will produce more heat. So what will happen to your breathing when you have a fever? Tell me you followed that. Watch. When you take, when somebody has surgery, do you want that operating room to be really, really hot? Where it's like, yeah, you're sweating. You're like, take it off your shirt. Do you want it to be that hot? No. Why? What? And what does heat do to blood vessels in the skin? Dilates them. So when the surgeon cuts into the skin, do you want blood spurtling everywhere? No. Because as the core body temperature begins to drop, because it's cold in that operating room, the blood vessels in the skin are going to constrict. That's why when you cut them open in an operating room, blood ain't spurtling all over the place. Say yes. And watch. You need oxygen. They're on a mechanical ventilator, right? They're going to breathe a tube into them, and they're sending oxygen. You want to make sure that that body doesn't need a ton of oxygen. So the colder that body is, the less oxygen it requires. Tell me you got that. So if you want to lose weight and burn ATP, go into a sauna. Just live there. The weight will fall off you, man. Plus, when the body temperature is high, that decreases the hypothalamus's need for food. That's why you don't, you're, when you're exercising and you're hot, and again, everybody's entitled to their own opinion, but uh, you don't eat as much. In the winter, you pack it on, because what else are you going to do? Right? You can't do anything. It's cold out there, Joe. You know what you do? You just eat food. Look at the TV. I hate me too. How many people got this? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. Now watch. Once the oxygen is dumped off, where does all that venous blood come back to? Watch. Are you still sending some blood to the relatively non-metabolically active parts of your body? Absolutely. Now watch. If you got a hot cup of coffee, what can you do besides blow on it to cool it off? Take the lid off. <laughs> <laughs> you should be more specific. I should just tell you. Like let it sit for a while? I don't know. Yeah, there you go. You can put ice in it. Say yes. So watch. What happens is this. When that venous blood is returning from the metabolically active parts of your body, Who's following me? It's going to mix with venous blood from the relatively metabolically inactive parts. So when that blood gets back to the right atrium, what's going to happen to the overall temperature of the blood? It will what? It will go down. And when the temperature goes down and that blood is sent to the lungs, the hemoglobin changes shape back and allows oxygen to bind to the iron on hemoglobin. Say yes. How many people follow that? That's how it works. And in your book, if you read about the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, 
Well, Timmy just broke it down for you, for the crowd. You know who will explain that to you? You think I'm lying. Right? I invented this explanation. I won $3 at a carnival explaining it. And I was guessing people's weight. How many people followed that a little bit? I want that whole thing. Say yes. Mm -hmm. That's how oxygen knows to bind to iron in the lungs and let go when it gets down to the cell. Say yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I show you something? I'm going to show you anyway. Especially this time of year. Right? How many people turn down their heat? Sissies. I just sat in my bedroom and just shivered all night. Oh, no way I'm turning that heat on. You know? Like, I don't sleep through the night, and then my girl, she gets so pissed, right? So the rest of my house is cold. So is the bedroom, right? Because I just like sleeping in the cold. So I go out there, and I get something to eat, like a piece of bread. Then I'll bring it into the bed, and I'll start chewing on it. And then I'm cold, so I touch her, and she gets so pissed. <laughs> You think that's mean, don't you? Yeah, it's not. So there. Okay, what was I going to explain to you? Oh, I got it. Watch. Watch. Hang on, where is it? Where is it? Okay, watch. Carbon monoxide poisoning. Do you know how it works? Do you want to know how it works? Do you? Well, give me a dollar. What? You ever see somebody uh, dead from carbon monoxide poisoning? Probably not, right? I have. They never looked healthier in their life. They got these little rosy cheeks. They look just so healthy. And they're dead. Do you know how it works? Watch. When oxygen binds to the iron on hemoglobin in the lungs, when it gets down to the cell, what does the oxygen do? It let, it's let goes of the iron and goes into the cell so you can make ATP. You got me? Watch. That's a red blood cell. I made it red this time. What's the protein inside a red blood cell? Do you notice how smaller the hemoglobin's getting each time I do this? What's embedded in the heme portion of the hemoglobin? Iron. What binds to the iron? Oxygen. Just so you know, this is carbon monoxide, and this is oxygen. Carbon monoxide and oxygen compete for binding to the iron on hemoglobin. Are you with me? If carbon monoxide wins, when it gets down to the cell, it won't let go. So every time that blood circulates and it has a carbon monoxide bound to it, it's one less iron oxygen can bind to. And every time that blood circulates, if you are still exposed to the carbon monoxide, if the carbon monoxide wins, then you will slowly asphyxiate yourself. And if you do it right, you'll kind of fall off to sleep and then you'll wake up dead. Are you following? That's why people, when they try to kill themselves and they stick the holes into the car window, uh, uh, uh. That is a high level of carbon monoxide and it will cause you to throw up. You'll die, but it will be a nasty death. You just close the garage door, then turn on the car. <laughs> and play Stairway to Heaven. <laughs> um, it, and it happens, it happens a lot. It happens a lot. There were these, uh, uh, this couple, right? Uh, their parents wouldn't let them have sex in the house, so they, it was cold outside, so they went into the garage, they shut the door, turned on the car, played Stairway to Heaven, bumped ugly for a little bit, and both died. And here's the thing. 
it's colorless and odorless so you don't know that you're being exposed to it that's why you should have a co detector like near your furnace so the first place and the most common cause is like a leaky furnace or a blocked vent for the uh, furnace pipe that's why in the winter time right when you blow the snow you better make sure those little pipes that come out of your uh, side of your house are uh, clean because the CO starts building up and carbon monoxide is um, slightly lighter than air that's why in the mines they'd have like little parakeets or little birds up there and if the bird is like chirp 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 and then boom they knew to uh, get out of there because carbon monoxide was building up so uh, if you get a pet bird or you know what put your, put your cat up in a cage just way up high <laughs> Or maybe your boyfriend or husband. Put them up there. Does it rise or sink? You know, it, I, I, I was just wondering. I, you know what? I'm always unsure about that. Yeah. I'm always unsure about that. But my thought is, is that it has to be slightly lighter than air because why would they put the birds up high? Why wouldn't they have them down low? Mm -hmm. That's my thought. I can look it up at break, but I'm really probably not going to. <laughs> <laughs> so, watch. And this happened. Did I tell you about the dude that had my class like five or six years ago? Sat right there. And one student came in and sat in his chair. So he did this. Walking back and forth. And I'm like, wait a minute. What the hell is going on here? There's going to be a thing here? Well, she's sitting in my chair. I'm like, is your name on it? And he's like, Tim, come on, for real. Semester three quarters over at Vaughn, we sitting there, now she's sitting there, I'm like, look, will you move? <laughs> Here's my point, right? So if someone has carbon monoxide poisoning, the first thing they do is they give them 100% oxygen. So what that does is that increases the pressure of oxygen to try to push the carbon monoxide off the iron. If that doesn't work, they put them in a hyperbaric chamber so it forces the carbon monoxide off the iron. So that's the treatment for carbon monoxide poison. Say yeah. Right. Tell me you followed this. Yes or no? Killing this. We'll have, we'll have the midterm cardiovascular quiz and the respiratory quiz all together. Right now. Okay. What are the two ways oxygen is transported in the blood? And it's measured as a what? Partial pressure, and you better write the abbreviation too. There you go. And what's the other way? What's the best way? Bound to the iron on a red blood cell. Say yeah. How long do red blood cells live? This is the only thing you're ever going to remember from this class. Red blood cells live 120 days. You don't even have to write that down. You'll never forget that. You won't. I can ask you 10 years from now. How long is 120 days, Tim? No. I'm sure everything else was. Okay, here we go. What's a byproduct of metabolism that you got to get rid of? That's really the only one you know that you have to get rid of, right? Okay. Carbon dioxide is transported three ways. One is dissolved in the plasma, and it's measured as a PCO2. You got me? The other way is, what's this? See? What's the protein inside a red blood cell? That's good. There is this guy. This is called the amino group. Uh, they opened up for Menudo at Summerfest. Menudo.
carbon monoxide is attached to the amino group on hemoglobin. People used to think that carb carbon dioxide and oxygen competed for binding to iron. Don't ever say that. That's not true. Carbon dioxide is bound to the amino group on hemoglobin. And the final and most abundant way is bound or transported as what's this? Come on. Come on. Nice. That's bicarbonate. 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 What's this? Bicarbonate. So how is carbon dioxide transported? Dissolved in the plasma, bound to the amino group on hemoglobin, and as bicarbonate ions. When you get to advanced, I'll explain how that works. I just want you to know this right now. Say yes. That's how oxygen and carbon dioxide are transported in the blood. Okay, watch. Pulmonary circulation, pulmonary circulation, pulmonary circulation. Inferior, inferior superior vena cava, right atrium, tricuspid valve, right ventricle, pulmonic valve, pulmonary trunk, left and right pulmonary arteries, pulmonary arterioles, pulmonary capillaries. And you better include this in your answer. Every pulmonary capillary is associated with a one-cell thick membrane called an alveoli. And that's where gas exchange occurs in the lungs. Say yes. You already knew that if you knew the circulation of blood through the heart, didn't you? See, I just put that in there. It's just kind of like, you know, make sure you just reinforce it. premature, their lungs are fully developed. Do you understand that? Don't ever say their lungs aren't developed. That's not true. Inside your lungs, is it moist and meaty inside your lungs? Yes. What does water make things do? Stick. Stick. Say yes. That's why when you lick your fingers when you're not reading the textbook. Get that? No. Watch. Watch. What do the alveoli do when you take a breath in? They expand. When you blow the breath out, what do the alveoli tend to do? Look at my hands. <laughs> they tend to collapse. And because there's water in there, the walls of the alveoli tend to stick together. And when the alveoli collapse, you get a condition called atelectasis. Have you ever heard of atelectasis? No? That'd be a good name for a rock group. It's here for atelectasis. And they're hit slow motion. I like it like that. <laughs> See, that's funny. You know what that's called? That's called juxtaposition. An old bald-headed white guy trying to sing a rap song. Okay, so watch. Babe, you better write this down. Who's writing this down? Joe, you writing it down? Yes, sir. All right, rock on with thy bad self. Here we go. I don't like this. Oh, yeah, I like this. Look at that. 
that smooth muscle. Look at that. Ooh. Ooh. Did I do this already? Good. Watch. These are alveoli. You got me? When you take a breath in, think of them as like little balloons, right? You blow air into them, you take air in, they expand. When you blow the air out, they tend to collapse, right? So inside the lining of the alveoli, there are specialized cells called type 2 alveolar cells. And these type 2 alveolar cells secrete a substance called surfactant. Surfactant is produced by type 2 alveolar cells during the seventh month of gestation. Babies born before the seventh month of gestation do not produce what? Surfactant. Surfactant. So when the baby pops out and the doctor takes them and slaps them on the butt, right? And the kid goes, oh, what the? Do they slap them on the butt anymore? No. What do they do? Shake them? I think they just kind of stimulate them a little. I don't think they... They don't slap them? No. I think that's a terrible way to enter the world, right? Yeah, didn't do anything. Do All I did was got born, and now I'm getting my, my ass beat. <laughs> right, maybe, I don't know. They do something. I don't know anything about kids, so I don't, I don't know. So anyways, they take their big, first big deep breath, right? And what does that do to the alveoli? Expands them. But if they're born before the seventh month, when they blow that breath out, what do the alveoli do? They collapse and the walls stick together. So they go into respiratory distress. Say yes. yes. Then they have to get it put on a little baby ventilator, and they have to be the air has to get forced into their lungs. Tell me you got that. Mm -hmm. And then they're placed on one of the ventilator settings. You'll learn about this when you get into clinical. It's called PEEP. They take those little marshmallow things <laughs> and they stick them down to ET tube. This is called positive end expiratory pressure. So as the baby is blowing the breath out normally, the machine puts a little positive pressure to keep those alveoli from collapsing. If they know the baby's coming early, and rarely do they, right? That's usually a surprise. What they can do is they can actually inject a synthetic um, surfactant into the mother to cause the baby to start producing. It's called surfacan. You ever hear of it? And if the baby... If they comes out unexpectedly, they can produce a, they can actually put a synthetic uh, surfactant down the ET tube so the baby doesn't have to be on the ventilator for very long. Because the longer a baby's on a ventilator, the more complications they tend to have. But that's how that works. Tell me that makes sense. That's why babies born before the seventh month are in trouble. Let me see that, please, thank you. All right, did I do that? I did that. I did that, right? Oh, that's good. Right. Number nine. Okay, take a break, and we're going to do number, when you come back, we'll do number nine. Somebody needs to remind me to resume. Uh, ready? Here we go. I did a real good job on that asthma video, I just want to tell you a few things. All right? Watch. I sound like Joey Bag of Donuts. Yeah, I did a great job on that video. You know why you hiccup? No. Here's why. I don't know. <laughs> Write this down. This is revolutionary. The immune system protects you. How many people knew that? 
How does it protect you? Ah, now silence, huh? Yeah, that's how it goes. Oh, I can't believe you said the immune system protects you. How does it protect you? I heard I something. That is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I told you that? Yeah. That was the last note I have. Oh, so the immune system protects you, and it protects you by producing inflammation. And what's inflammation, Sarah? That's right. Massive arterial vasodilation. Watch. Joe, watch. Where's that glove? I like those gloves. Just so you know, I'm going to count them before I leave, because I think some of you like them, too. <laughs> this glove represents an artery in the lining of the respiratory tract. Tell me you got that. This is the hole that air goes through. Are you following me? If you get an immune response in your respiratory tract, what do the arteries do, Sarah? They dilate. So if they dilate, what happens to the diameter of the airways? It gets smaller. What does epinephrine do to arteries? Say yes. Very good. Here we go. An allergy is one time your body does stuff that doesn't make sense. An allergy is an exaggerated immune response. It's your immune system responding, over-responding to something it shouldn't over-respond to. Tell me you got that. And how does the immune system respond? By producing... Inflammation. And what is inflammation, Sarah? Dilation. You had it so good when you read it the first time. <laughs> Massive arterial vasodilation. Say yes. So anyone with asthma has allergies. Say yes. That's why watch. You're not going to believe this. Eczema is an allergy. That's why eczema and asthma go hand in hand. <laughs> huh? Tell me you followed this. All right. So I'm going to explain to you asthma. I want this whole thing. Anybody? <laughs> no. It's, oh. yeah. <laughs> it's <clears throat> <laughs> she would really. <laughs> then, wait, want to hear the rest of the story just real quick? And then I'll get through this and then whatever. Just look. Look at a penny worth of 1.7. Did you see that? You should watch that. There's a the 1969 Cubs. That's Ron Santa right there, number 10. You know that. <laughs> yeah, who cares? What was I going to tell you? Oh, uh, Marianne, right? So Marianne gets out of my class. It's like two years later, so she's in clinical, right? So I'm going down, I'm getting something to drink right before my night class, and she's walking this way down that hall where you go to the cafeteria. And I'm like, oh, get her make it look like I'm doing something, right? <laughs> so I'm trying to walk past without, <laughs> like, we're the only two people in the hall. So she goes, hey, Tim. And I go, hey, Marianne. <laughs> and she goes, Tim, can I tell you something? And I go, yeah. And she goes, I pulled up to the technical building tonight, and I looked up at the fifth floor, and I never realized how much I learned in those four walls. And I go, you know who you're talking to, right? <laughs> and she goes, Tim, I take back, I apologize. But it made a difference. And I'm like, you're kidding me. And she goes, no. And I go, well, what's in it for me? Are you going to give me money? And then she walked away, and she was pissed again. <laughs> she goes like this. She goes, <clears throat> Did she do well in your class then? She did, but, like, she, ugh. <laughs> Could have used that. Okay, ready? 
Okay, here we go. I'm going over asthma. As if you didn't know. All right, hang on. That kind of weirds me out. Watch. I don't know why I do this too, but I can't help it. Watch. Asthma is an exaggerated immune response that occurs, that primarily occurs in the bronchioles. The bronchioles are made of muscle. Tell me you got that. What are the two things muscle can do? There you go. So these little bands here, these guys right here, are bronchioles. And then the little air sacs are alveoli. So now you're looking at the inside of a bronchial. You got me? So I'm allergic to cats. So if I see a cat and I pet it, here, kitty, kitty, I pet it. And because cats are evil, who's got a cat? Okay. Your grade has just been reduced by 10%. <laughs> and you suck in a cat hair ball, you're going to get, if you're allergic to it, you're going to get an exaggerated, an exaggerated immune response. Who's following this? Mm -hmm. So the lining of the respiratory system is vascular. So in response to this exaggerated immune response, you are going to get massive arterial vasodilation so what's going to happen to the size of the bronchioles? They will get what? Smaller. Smaller. Because the, the arteries of the lining will dilate and the lumen, the hole, will get smaller. So if the bronchioles get smaller, what happens to resistance to airflow? So what has to happen to airway pressure in order to maintain airflow? It has to go up. And how do you create a greater difference in airway pressure? By creating a greater lung volume. So how do they start breathing? <sighs> Say yes. And the hallmark of asthma is this. What are these guys right here? Muscle. So watch, normally, normally in the lower airways because it's been cleaned, humidified and filtered, right? Warmed, the air in the lower airway flows in a laminar fashion, a layered fashion. But the hallmark of asthma is the bronchospasms, the muscular wall of the bronchioles, they begin to spasm. So the wall becomes wavy. And wavy walls produce turbulent airflow. And turbulent airflow produces wheezing. That's why they wheeze. See? Yeah. <coughs> Thanks. Joe was coughing to kind of illustrate my point. Tell me you got that, guys. Who's following this? So, watch. The body does stuff that makes sense. So if somebody puts a gun to your head and says, give me your AMP book or I'm going to kill you. <laughs> I'm like, here, take it. You didn't have to, don't bother me. <laughs> if somebody's going to threaten your life, what hormones released into the blood? And what does epinephrine do to all of your blood vessels throughout your body? It constricts them. What does it do to your bronchioles? Constricts them? Watch. You're scared. Do you have to get more air into and out of your lungs when you're running or fighting for your life? So do you want your bronchioles to constrict and go, <laughs> do you want that? No, you want your bronchioles to dilate, so watch. Embedded in the smooth muscle of your bronchioles are receptors called beta receptors. 
What binds to beta receptors? And don't say beta. <laughs> epinephrine. These are actually beta-2 receptors. And when epinephrine binds to beta-2 receptors, it causes the muscle to relax and the bronchioles to dilate. What does epinephrine do to the blood vessels that dilate it because you sucked in a cat hair ball? What does it cause them to do? It causes them to constrict. So what happens to the size of the airway now if the muscles relax and the arteries constrict? It gets, it gets what? It dilates. So how do fe people feel? Oh, good. I can read the textbook now. <sighs> Say yes. So every time someone has an asthma attack, should you give them a shot of epinephrine? That's excessive. So they have drugs that mimic epinephrine. One of the drugs is called... albuterol and watch 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 you shake it all about hit it here you got me and that will get into the lungs stimulate beta 2 receptors and cause the bronchioles to dilate and constrict the blood vessels in the lining of those bronchioles so the airway will open up Say yes. So if you have a little kid with asthma and you go, okay, Joey, time for your nebulizer treatment. Right? Or Eddie. Right? Maya has it, but not Eddie. Eddie? Eddie, you don't got it? No, just okay. Maya. Just Maya? Okay. So you put the little mask and they're sucking the albuterol and then parents can't figure out why their kids are like. <laughs> 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 because they're hopped up on a drug that mimics epinephrine. Tell me you got that. Mm -hmm. So what are the side effects of an albuterol inhaler? Jitters. That's why, watch, I, I don't know. I forgot what I was gonna say. <laughs> Those are the side effects because they mimic epinephrine. How many people have ever taken an albuterol inhaler? Right? How many people know how to do it right? Yeah, well, we're going to find out, right? Some people, they don't know how to do it. Just like, a, like they suck on it like it's a freaking, like a one-hitter. You know? They're like... <laughs> you take drugs? No. Maybe that's your problem. <laughs> So watch, most people don't know how to do it, so when they hit it, all that albuterol hits the back of the throat, mm -hmm. and what does it do to blood vessels? It constricts them. When you constrict blood vessels, you cut off blood supply to the back of your throat, that's why the back of your throat hurts for a while. Right? Say so, yeah. Okay, watch. What caused this? What caused this? What? An exaggerated immune response. So if you see a cat, here, kitty, kitty, do you want your immune system to have this exaggerated response? No. no. What suppresses your immune system? Good. Steroids suppress your immune system. That's why if you've got a kid and they go to the hospital, that's Spanish for hospital. They're given the albuterol in treatment, and then if it's really bad, watch, 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 you're gonna learn something. They're given what's called a med dose pack. Have you ever heard of a med dose pack? It's prednisone. Step down, boom. And prednisone is a steroid which reduces suppresses the immune system, and what's the primary function of the immune system? To produce inflammation. 
How many kids, people here have a kid or maybe themselves that have asthma? Are they on a steroid inhaler too? Yeah. yeah. They are. Watch. You're told after you take the steroid inhaler to do what? Wash your mouth mm -hmm. out. Because watch. If you smack that steroid inhaler into the back of your throat, what's its job? To suppress your immune system. Mm -hmm. And if you suppress the immune system in the back of your throat, you get a fungal infection called thrush. That's why they tell you to rinse your mouth out after you take it. Do you have any idea how good this information is? It's top quality. Say yes. Know this. Know this. It takes three to four weeks of continued steroid inhaled treatment to adequately suppress the immune system. But what happens? The kid starts feeling better, so they, he's not taking his albuterol, and the parents don't give him the steroid inhaler anymore, and Three months later, they're back in the ER. And they need to tell you that. That if your kid goes, Mom, Mom, I'm a breathing mother. I ain't never breathed better in my life. And if they're breathing really good, you say, Here, Jasper, still suck on your steroid inhaler. Do you understand that? Yeah. And there's a chemical, I'm just talking here, that's released in response to this uh, exaggerated immune response called leukotrienes. And leukotrienes increase that uh, bronchospasm. So there's a drug out there that inhibits leukotrienes called Singular. Have you ever heard of Singular? That's what my yeah, see? That you take 10 milligrams once a day, ain't that right? Yeah. It's a leukotriene inhibitor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Makes say that. That's for the asthma and allergies. It is. Yeah. Tell me you got that. That's asthma. How many people got that? So Do you feel good about that? Uh, albuterol and steroids. Okay. Say yeah. So in um, talking about the pathophysiology of asthma, do you want us to talk about leukotrienes at all? No. No. You can, uh, when you get into clinical, you can forget I, uh, I talked about that, and then you'll just get that one wrong. No, don't worry about that. Just understand that the function of uh, the albuterol and the function of the steroid, right? Watch, if you jack up your back, they will give you prednisone. Because when you jack up your back, you get inflammation. Mm -hmm. And what do steroids do? They suppress the immune system so they reduce inflammation. So yeah. What else we gotta do? Is that it? Oh, okay. To the this will take two seconds. And then ambulate. And don't hate. Mm -hmm. uh, how many people are going to take the essay for the, multi or for the multiple guests? That was subliminal. <laughs> <laughs> how many people are going to take the essay on Thursday? Okay, I'll be here at 5 o'clock. How many people could come earlier than 5 o'clock? How many people take a long time to write? You can you come earlier than five o'clock? Probably not. I can try. I'll bring it to your work. <laughs> I, it's not my work. It's when my husband gets home because of the kids. I'll work for him. Where does he work? <laughs> well, right now he's working in Alcorn. I'll go out there. <laughs> I'll drive it out there. Um, I'll be here at uh, four thirty. Can you come at four? Who can come at four thirty? Okay, get your fatty acid in here. <laughs> you know why? I want to go trick-or-treating. I don't care. I'm going. Um, I'm just knock on people's door. Hey. <laughs> what if we bring the candy to you and then you can just say trick-or-treat like multiple times and we just keep handing you? That's ridiculous. <laughs> I think it's better I that I just randomly know. knock on doors. <laughs> 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 okay, wait, we're almost done. What do I got to do? You know what? I already did that. Do we have to identify the label price? No, that's on the final. Here we go. I'm going through it very fast. So this is recording, so you're going to have to listen to it. Ready?
nares, nasal cavity, nasopharynx, oropharynx, laryngopharynx, larynx. What's after the larynx? My name is, my name is, the what? The trachea, the main stem bronchi, the lobar bronchus, the segmental bronchus, the bronchioles, the alveolar duct, and the alveoli. Alveoli. Say yes, ravioli. And you better know the functions of the upper airway are to warm, filter, and humidify the air. Say yeah. Yes or no? Okay. Uh, Tuesday, Tuesday we're going to start the, uh, you know what we should do is just have the cardiovascular quiz and then we should have the midterm on uh, Tuesday. Why is that a bad? Huh? Well, then we're going to pick times on Tuesday and Thursday you're, we're going to have it. Wait. I thought we were having the midterm on Thursday. Yeah, we are. Oh, Wait, what? Midterm on Wait. Thursday. Next Thursday. Yeah. Thursday you got the cardiovascular quiz. Right. A week from Thursday you got the midterm. Right. The following Thursday right. you got the respiratory quiz. Say yes. Okay. That's on tape too, so I can't change it. Now.